I'm DB, aka Danielle Bezalow, and I'll be your host for the next six episodes of this podcast and beyond. Sex, birth control, bondage, domination, sadism, and masochism. Everyone took the condoms, blew them up in the hallway. Conversations about STI and safer sex did not happen. My first time I saw a condom, I was 20 years old. Never do anything that doesn't feel right to you. Otherwise, you're not consenting. I don't even know about a penis's anatomy. I want to be someone who talks more about it openly to degrossify it. So there we were, starting a sex ed club. <laughs> Welcome to Sex Ed with DB, an intersectional feminist podcast for folks who want to hear real stories from five Bay Area voices as we try to revolutionize the way we talk about sex. This is episode three. So can you talk a little bit about the definitions of what monogamy is and what polyamory is? So monogamy is whenever somebody is with one partner at a time. It is uh, often idealized in Western culture as the way to do it, although it's not going to work for everybody. And so there are some people who feel like that they just don't get all their needs met from their partner. And it's a whole lot of pressure to put on one person to meet all your needs. Remember, this is Ivy Chen, a sexuality professor at SF State who has been teaching sex ed in the Bay for over 20 years. To be your best friend, your confidant, your lover, your companion, your chef. Yeah, you yeah them to exactly. Make you food. Like every single interest that you possibly have, this one person needs to fulfill that. Poly, of course, means many, and amour means love. And so I, I don't necessarily think that a person who is in a polyamorous relationship is just oversexed, right? And that they just have to have so many different people to have sex with. But in many cases, The explanation is that they just have a lot of love to give as well as a lot of different connections they want to uh, to have with different people. So that would be polyamorous. What I love about what my guest speakers, uh, my polyamory panel says is, look, we're not here to convert you guys, right? We realize that many of you are going to be monogamous and you're happy with that and that's working for you. But it's just that you might be a doctor or a lawyer or a judge and if you come upon a polyamorous couple, group, family, right? Don't um, penalize us for that for that lifestyle, right? Or for that choice um, and say, oh, that makes you unfit parents. We're going to take your kids away, right? Or um, you know what? You're a perv and we're going to fire you. I mean, that's not legal to do, but I feel that there are some poly folks who are in the closet, right? Because of fear of judgment or, um, or you know, these types of legal risk that they might be taking with that, you know, or just reputation. Can you talk about how monogamy and polyamory look really different for every type of relationship? I feel like often when people hear the term, you know, polyamory, like you said, people think like, oh, those people just want to have a ton more sex. Uh Um, But the reality is it's messy and it's fluid and it's kind of always, you know, term. You have to come to terms with your partner about your boundaries. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, I mean, there's just constant communication that's happening. In fact, I have a set of guest speakers in my, in my SF state class uh, and they talk about their experiences and they're like, you know what we do more than anything else? Scheduling. And also, yeah, I mean, you just, you just have to make sure that you're kind of fair with the time that you spend with each partner. And in many cases, they might actually have a primary partner and so whom they might live with, they might even have children with. And so in that case, they have to balance out their responsibility to one partner or their life situation, right? Especially if they are a parent, uh, to other relationships. And so it's not like it's not likely that they'll have 10 other partners, right? But they might have two or three or maybe possibly four, but it it is a lot of juggling, right? In terms of time. And, you know, so they might say our love is unlimited, but time and energy, right? You know, that's, that is limited. And so therefore you have to, to be able to, to communicate um, whom you're going to be with when and whom and where. One definition of polyamory is being interested in or pursuing intimate relationships, emotional and or sexual, with more than one person at the same time in a consensual, open, informed setting. Are you a polyamorous person or what's your what's your style? So <clears throat> if we break down polyamory to the Latin roots, we have poly more than one Amor, amor, love. So more than one love, more than one intimacies. Remember, this is Aaron Steinfeld, an educator and activist who teaches youth in Oakland about healthy relationships and how to prevent abusive ones. 
I have a primary partner. He and I are non-monogamous. We have usually, like, sexual dates with other people. And by usually, I mean we are... We more when we're engaging with people outside of each other, usually it's in a sexual context. I don't think that ne- I'm necessarily practicing polyamory. I'm not necessarily interested in developing emotional intimacy or dating multiple people, but it does feel important to me if I feel like it to be able to have the freedom to have sex with people outside of my primary partnership. What are some ways that a one and only is expressed in our culture and what's maybe a song or a book or a movie that really affected you when you were young to be like I I need that like one person for the rest of my life Adele's song called one and only definitely (laughs) played a huge role one and only When that album first came out, I was going through a breakup and I latched onto that song and I was like, that will be the song that I will dance to at my wedding. Cut to now being like, hell fucking no. I think almost every song written by a straight person about relationships or love is monogamy is uh, assumed. You're my girl. I want all of you forever. You and me every day. <laughs> I just want to be somebody that can add to your wife, be a friend, be a teacher, and a fan too. You're still the one I run to. TV shows, uh, movies, media, ad campaigns, advertising. Um, when you see a family in an advertisement, it's usually a mom and a dad and kids. They're usually white and they usually have their own house. There's a lot of things because the average American, right? And like, those aren't necessarily the experiences of everyone. But it's it's one of those things that's so everywhere that you can't, it's hard to like point at a specific thing because it is just a general cultural script. There are so many cultural scripts around monogamy. And when someone's like, how do I learn how to date? They can look at literally any resource and look, read about monogamy. And a lot of those resources aren't calling what they're doing monogamy. They're just calling it dating. I've been in non-monogamous relationships, monogamous relationships. I think in my current relationship, the current iteration of our boundaries is uh, feels really natural for me and feels really good for me. And again, that's less about emotional intimacy with other people and more about sexual intimacy with other people. And you talked about not being jealous. Um, how ha- have there been times where you have been jealous and, and you know, how, how do you talk yourself kind of down from those moments? Um, and can you define compersion? Yes. Cause compersion is one of the main ways that I talk myself down from jealousy. Compersion. I'm honestly, every time I, type it into Microsoft Word. It's one of those words that gets squiggly red underlined, as does transphobia. Is another example of a word that needs to have a dictionary definition. Compersion is when someone who I care about is doing something that's fun for them, me feeling excited that they're doing a fun thing. If this if someone I'm dating is like really stoked to like about to go have sex with someone, I generally feel super stoked because they're stoked. I think also it's this, it's the other side of jealousy where it's like, oh, you're going to do this thing and I'm not. That makes me sad. It's you're going to do this thing and that makes you feel good. So I'm going to feel good because you feel good. I think compersion can also go the other way where it's like, if the person I care about is sad, that kind of makes me sad and we're going to talk through why they're sad and talk through what those feelings are just like a general support system yeah it's a general way of thinking about feelings not as this zero sum you have something i can't have or you're doing this thing that i'm not doing but more as this like sharing of feelings and support of feelings i really only tend to feel jealous when I'm in a relationship where my boundaries aren't where I want them to be. 
in my current relationship because our boundaries have felt really good for me the whole time. I haven't really felt jealous when my partner goes and has sex with someone else. But in past relationships where the boundaries have been different or I feel like my partner is more sexually desired by society than I am or what have you when experiences feel lopsided, that sort of is where jealousy creeps in. And I think of jealousy like I think of other like socialized things. I'm like, is A is this jealousy truly coming from me or is it coming from a place of society telling me what I should feel? And I think separating those two things out is really messy and really challenging. And there's still so much validity when someone feels jealous and those conversations need to be talked through. I think jealousy is like definitely a source of contention in non-monogamous relationships. I think jealousy is definitely a source of contention in monogamous relationships I honestly think that capitalism has a big role to play in jealousy because it's this idea that I'm going to try and get myself ahead or I'm going to try and acquire experiences or I'm going to try and do as much as I can. And inherently, me doing more means someone else doing less. I think jealousy comes a lot from people feeling like they don't have access to what their partner has access to. Neither polyamory or monogamy are monoliths. Every relationship looks different and has different boundaries. It's taken like a lot of different forms, strategies that I can think of like right now. Again, like I like to know what is going on. Remember, this is Pristine Shin, an educator and activist living in Oakland. So like with a person, let's say I'm like I'm seeing somebody... Whether it's a new thing or an old thing, like I generally like like to know what's going on so that I feel included. So whether or not somebody else comes in the picture, like if I'm included in this process, then it's like, yay, look at you and your new love. And I'm a part of it. I'm still a part. Of, I'm not being left. Right. It's, so you're saying if your partner starts seeing if my someone. partner sees, starts seeing somebody else, it's helpful for me to know when they are talking to someone, if they're feeling excited about it and like want, and letting them know this is what I need. It might not be what you need, but it's what I need. If they are going to be sleeping with them or like cooking up with them or have intention to do so, like wanting to do that and wanting to know how they're feeling about it and it, wanting that to be a safe space. Don't tell me, oh, it's not that big deal, whatever, whatever, when you're actually feeling really stoked about it. Like I want to know if you're feeling stoked about it so that I can feel connected to you and so that if like so that I can also share in your joy if it's something that's important for you. I think just like being updated and knowing what's going on and knowing beforehand if I can and, and check-ins afterwards and like debriefing. And I think that helps me feel included and that this person cares about how I feel and is thinking of me in this process and moving forward. Could you talk a little bit about your relationship right now and how your, what your agreements are around that? Sure. Um, I, do you want me to give background as to like how I came to this position? Uh Uh-huh. Cool. That probably would make a lot more sense. So I, uh, grew up very Christian and, you know, like had very good examples with my parents and, and I, and, and also have a good example of a monogamous relationship through my parents of people who love and care for each other. And they have always had a very like faithful and spiritual relationship with each other and kind of have formed their relationship around common bonds of faith and what Christianity and the Bible has kind of outlined as what partnership looks like, which I think in a lot of ways I appreciate and also in a lot of ways I don't. And so I grew up seeing them. I also grew up in this sort of liberal, young, hip, white, contemporary church, you know, where it was like cool to be straight edge. And it was cool because you were, you know, standing out from the crowd and you weren't adhering to peer pressure and you're being your own person. And you, for like young Christian men, like taking pride in, you know, not being a sex crazed young teenager and like respect, quote unquote, respecting women. Um, and for a young, like church going and or like God fearing or like God loving Christian woman to, you know, having like purity rings that say true love waits. And in a part of it, I appreciate, I respect in, in saying like, yeah, if a homie can't wait, probably should like, like something probably is not okay there. Right. And that being an empowering message, I think in, in ways and also in the the way in which relationships and marriage and 
specifically in the Bible, like hetero, 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 what's, what's that word called? (laughs) Heteronormative? Sure. Uh, Monogamous Christian relationships are also kind of delineated and structured based off of God's relationship to the church. Like often God is like related to like the, the man in the relationship and the church is, is called his bride. And so the way in which they are devoted to each other and are supposed to be selfless and are supposed to be whatever in the way that in the way that love is talked about in Christianity and something that I was really drawn to is about this selflessness and about serving others and about being different from the selfish do, do like, serve yourself, get, get yours culture that I do feel like is very a part of capitalist American culture. And so growing up, I, and also very much being real gay from a real young age and probably loving a lot of my friends that were women in ways that I didn't even understand and seeing all the bullshit relationships they were in with all these guys who like were fuckheads and like didn't know how to treat them right. And understanding that like I probably wanted to and understanding that I could probably do a better job. And I understood what they, I understood like what they deserved and all these things and really wanting the opportunity to do that or like to treat somebody that way or like to be selfless and to be the best partner somebody could possibly be very much informed by these like Christian ideals, which is what I went into, into the first sort of like love experience that I had. And was incredibly selfless and like denied myself to uplift my partner and to support my partner and like the idea of monogamy being a choice and like faithfulness being a choice and like taking pride in that sort of narrative and really kind of going a little bit overboard with it and it turning and being a little bit of a doormat and not necessarily like being true to myself or like stating my desires or being as 100% honest with my partner as I could have been or should have been. How old were you when that was happening? Like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Lasted <laughs> a little while. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, so like I would say like 16 when like really things were, were happening and This person that I was with was always very poly her whole life. And I was friends with her beforehand and we were best friends and we kind of fell for each other. And she was my first person ever like kiss or any other physical intimate thing. And also the first person I ever like love fell in love with. And I was her first like woman experience and it was like really intense and we were really young. And a lot of my like ideas around monogamy and like jealousy and possessiveness and other things that I felt were really justified based off of faith things that like really just like this script that I was like very ready to fill to like be this like good partner um, as defined by certain things. And it just like didn't work and it really fucked kind of both of us. One, cause she, very much was very free with her love and like from the beginning like had brought this thing up and I didn't understand it and I didn't want it and I there was a lot of codependency and emotional like abuse and manipulation and just like shit like bad shit that very much and then also this like twisted like dedication to it because that's what it means to be a good partner and to like fight through things and like work because relationships are work and whatever anyways that shit blew up in my face got officially quote unquote cheated on and that, but needed to be out of that relationship. And, and also in, in that period of time, like this whole relationship was a secret because I, again, was like very involved in my church, was really internally homophobic, was lying to this person, basically like hooked up one time. She was my best friend. I like lied to her, told her that it was a one-time thing. It could never happen again. And then I didn't feel anything like that towards her. Basically just like lied again, this very like self-pitying, like Christian self-sacrifice. Obviously I have these feelings, but I can't tell you because I can't do anything about it and I'm not going to act on it. And it's, and it's mean for me to tell you that I have any sort of feelings for you. Like you need to be able to move on and live in your life, right? This, and lied to all my friends, like was a really, yeah, just basically like was doing all these things because I, I, I was like grappling with what it meant to be queer and Christian. And after got, I got cheated on and realized like the biggest piece that hurt for me was not the fact that she had cheated on me because I think I had already gone through all of those emotions many times in our relationship before, but the fact that she had lied to me for, for two weeks. And it was a really big wake up call for myself around the ways in which I had been treating people that I cared about, lying to them to try to protect them, right? Lying to them to like, because I thought that was what, what, what would be best. And, and then re, really having a moment of revisiting like, yeah, 
The Bible may or may not say whatever it ambiguously says about homosexual acts, right? It also very clearly says not to lie. And it very clearly says all of these other things and just like had a really real moment of that really sucked. I'm doing all these things and having a moment also of real, realizing and feeling moments of connection with whatever like God or whatever anybody wants to think about of, you know, feeling God say something to me like, hey, like, if you trust me, one, I made you on purpose like this, so fucking deal with it. And if you trust me, like you need to trust me and it's going to be okay. And I started talking to people. I started coming out to my friends. After that summer, after freshman year of college was the first time when I went back to Cal was the first time I wasn't actively denying the fact that I was queer. And so it opened all sorts of doors. And I think really a, a, the biggest lesson I learned from that relationship was that that doesn't necessarily work for everybody and it doesn't work if you try to force it. And if, if we had just been able to talk to each other about what we wanted and also be honest about the fact that we still cared about each other and other loves were able to exist and create our own rules and have agency in that instead of just fulfilling the script, like so many other things could have happened. And as that developed, we got back together because we went to the same college. We got back together, though, with the understanding that I wanted to see other people and she also wanted to see other people. And really the reason why I started any sort of polyamory, like she wanted to get back together, told me all the things that I ever wanted to hear, but however many months too late, like I was no longer in that place and didn't want to be with her anymore. And she was like, look, like we still love each other. That's a fact. We also want to be with other people. Can we just try this thing, this poly thing? Can we try it for two weeks? If it doesn't work, fine. I will stop bothering you. But I, I, I want to, I want, I, I would really, it would really bother me if we didn't at least try. So we tried for two weeks and then just never really stopped and like was with this person when I met my next significant partner, and then my next significant partner, who is still my partner today, and it kind of has, yeah, I think it's mostly the, so I guess, so I guess the situation that I'm in right now after all of that is I've uh, been with my partner for over five years now. We've always been open in our relationship. I'm, we met each other when we were in existing partnerships, and uh, as of right now, she has another partner who is male bodied, who they've been together for over four years. She lives half time here with me, like half of the week and lives half uh, in Marin half of the week with her other partner. And I have had other like lovers and partners and um, continue to do so and also have a lot of like romantic uh, and intimate friendships um, with friends and yeah. And also I think, yeah, yeah. And I think for myself and in, in, in my own brain, I've been exploring like what it would mean. If, like, it's funny. Like, I, I think after all this time, because all of that was a journey in and of itself and like being chill with, with, with my partner, having another partner, like especially with somebody who's male bodied was like a big fucking struggle and journey. And now it's like really great. And like, he feels like family and all this stuff. And it's, 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 it's funny, like recently realizing that I've almost settled into the status quo of, okay, so like you have me and this other person and like really committed partnerships and I have you and I like do whatever the fuck I want otherwise, otherwise. And like, I'm not gonna have another partner. Like that would just shake things up or whatever. Like, you know, like falling into the status quo of this thing that's so not normal anyways. And I think challenging myself even now as to boundaries that I've put up around myself just because it's easier because it works and yeah, it's it's a continue it's a it's a continuous really creative and create like cr process of creation around like here's this wall that we're hitting. I can see and recognize all the ways in which this is supposed to go really badly based on normative standards. Like I can see the ways in which all of this is supposed to blow up in my face. But I don't really I don't really like that and I don't really have I don't really like anybody telling me what to do and I don't really like doing that and is there a way for us to like create our own rules so that it so that it works or so that it makes sense because maybe everybody will be on board and maybe there's a way for us to make this work. And I was talking to my therapist about, I was like, who, who, who primarily, who was queer and like primarily like serves like QT Pac folks. And I was like, Hey, like, is the shit that I talked to you about like normal? Cause she's like super cool, you know, just like keeps it chill. Like totally is like unfazed and like, deals with all my shit and like totally seems like she knows what she's talking about. And I'm just like, is this shit normal? Like I talked to her some like crazy shit. Like, are you just, is like, do other people talk about this shit too? And she was like, you know, I think, 
at like queer folks, specifically like QT Puck folks. Q explain what that means. Queer trans people of color and or any like combination of those things um, often have to be like creative um, in order to survive because systems that exist aren't created for us. And that could be related to family and that could be related to anything else. And by being ousted or not included in things like we have to create our own systems and we have to create our own networks and we have to create our own rules that work for us. And so like I really identify with that and I really identify with making my own rules with intention and communication and consent with all parties involved. And it feels more of a creative process. And I feel like any relationship, whether you describe it as monogamous or polyamorous is going to look different based off of what people like want to talk about. And I think it's about creating rules that like feel good for yourself and for the people that you're involved with and that allow everybody to like be their true selves and be honest and pursue things that make them whole and good while also like supporting each other in their in in that polycule is a delightful term for the extended web or network of people connected through various polyamorous relationships when they are in a closed easy to visualize system Plotting them out on paper can look like a bit of a structure of a molecule, hence the name. Often when people talk about their polycule, they're including not just their partners, but metamors as well. A metamor is someone who is in a romantic sexual relationship with your partner, but not with you. I mean, I just remember growing up of what is considered a traditional, what's a traditional life? Like, you know, uh at least for Latin people, like, I was so non-traditional. Remember, this is Ingrid Ochoa, an undergraduate coordinator and health education lecturer at SF State. Uh, you know, I was supposed to be, uh, after high school, I should have been, like, already looking for a partner to get married and to have kids and have a home. And and I just didn't want that. And so even that, like... Uh, I was faced where I was so non-traditional going to college. I was the first to go to college in my whole family and to graduate. And when I got to a certain age, they were like, when I did feel the pressure of getting married, I did. I, you know, when I think back in hindsight, I was like, wow, you know what? I I shouldn't have gotten married. I really saw the red flags and the yellow flags and all the different color flags you know, exploding in my face, and I still didn't look at it. And I, um, because it, it, it wasn't, it was like more of hindsight, like, wow, you know what, I was not meant to be married. People are still stuck in what that idea of marriage is supposed to be. And I did see the change in the switch of my partner, how they viewed marriage when we had that piece of paper signed. It did change. And I never thought that that would happen to me, and especially with the type of person that I am. But it did. It, and that's actually what affected like our relationship because it, it turned where I was supposed to have that submission, that submissive role of being the woman and cooking in the house. And it was like, well, hello, I never did that when we were dating. Why would I do that now that I'm married? Like, why just because I signed this fucking paper? Now I have to do that. Wait a second. Hello. You know, like, okay, what happened just now? You know, and, and, and it's really where it was interesting how people's minds kind of like what their view of marriage is, you know, and, um, and what that means. And it's also even socialized, because it's also how you what life experiences you've had and what representation, what examples you see. And I think now, more so now with like this generation, I have to say I'm so happy that it, it is different because there's more options. Um, my generation, there wasn't really those options. So I think, I think that the more that you see diversity in what marriage is or what does it look like, it opens up those doors of not seeing uh, also, well, you have to say San Francisco, we're in a bubble, okay? San Francisco, we're in a bubble. But at least talking about in San Francisco, at least because of the diversity, it really helps, I think, in this generation for people to feel that, oh, there's different options. That, you know, I don't need to have this this one set, being one set relationship. You can have many loves if you have this, this uh, 
you know, this understanding with your partner. And it is very easy to love more than one person. It's just a matter of like having that openness about it to um, be liberated about it. But also like um, having the idea that, well, you know what, it's okay. I'm not going to yuck someone's yum. If they, if they want to get married and they want to have that relationship, go for it. Good for you. Happy for you. But you need to really be mindful of what is it that you want. When I think back, it's like, you know, yeah, I wish I could have done things differently. But you know what? I learned from it. The way I see it is I learned from that. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about like, what is it that I want in the future too? And, um, and also like, what kind of relationships I want in my life? And who do I want in my life. And on also like, you know, those little really pay attention to those flags of like how people are and pay attention to it. Cause I saw those flags. I just never, I'm like, Oh, you know, you cannot change anybody. Definitely learn that. I would practice that. I mean, I would teach it and I'm like, shit, I need to practice that shit. You cannot change. That people. is my biggest struggle to date when yeah. I've been in relationships because it feels like Oh, no, they'll change for me. They'll yeah, want to. Yeah. They never they will. They will never will. It takes them to want to change if they want to change. But you need to accept the way they are. And if you don't, then you need to see that. And that is what I kept. That was my problem. I saw potential. I'm like, ooh, you have the potential to do this. Yeah, that's bullshit. Potential is just potential. That's it. It's not action. I'm like, I learned. Okay. I need to accept the person the way they are. If I'm not happy, that's it. I got to walk away. Yeah. So it's, you know. Learning experience. That's what life is, right? Yeah. Take it. Take it with a solid grain of salt. Grain of salt. Yeah, thank you. you. Got it. Yeah, you helped me. <laughs> Straight definition. Sure. I mean, monogamy, I feel like it's people who have decided that they only want each other and want to be with each other and not with anybody else, at least. That's what they think at the beginning. <laughs> this is Rebecca Levy, my mother and an OBGYN, a mother of three who runs her own private practice in Napa with over 2,000 patients. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, it kind of means that I feel like, a, well, personally, I'm not a big believer that people are monogamous for life people. I don't, I think that it's a little, um, it's a little demanding of people to feel like there's somebody there for you that you would not feel like anybody else could fulfill things that you need from another person. So I feel like if people want to make that commitment and that's what they say and they're sure about it, who am I to, to say no? But I just don't think it's a natural state of being. And polyamory, is, you know, is probably anything except that. People who, ha who choose or decide or agree to have relationships that involve other people consensually and, you know, in a way that doesn't hurt people's feelings or, you know, emotionally traumatize them if possible. Do you have anything you want to add about like monogamous um, and polyamorous stuff? Well, I, ha I have to say that I kind of feel like, like my apples, you and your brother and have not fallen far from the tree as far as how you guys feel about that. And you've both voiced that to me. And I think that's kind of interesting. Like it's a little bit of a fear, like to still be in a world where it is kind of expected of many people to just meet that person and get married. And what if, what if, what if there's somebody else out there, there's something else out there. And how do you, um, how do you rationalize that with yourself, knowing that maybe someone else that you're in a relationship with expects that of you, and maybe that's not who you are. There's a lot of that, you know, and yeah, I mean, for me, like, I feel like I'm so much more committed in my life to having kids than I am to getting married. And I don't really know if like that's realistic. Like if that's like what my partner, whoever I'm going to marry, if that's like what they want to or like how they feel about marriage. But it's just like to me, like a really, really beautiful but dated tradition. And I'm just like nervous that because of, you know, what I've learned from you and because of who I am is just like, I don't know necessarily if it is realistic for me personally to be expected to be with one person forever. And like you said, I don't think it's healthy to rely on one person to fulfill all of your needs because especially if that person becomes not that person anymore, then like, who do you have to who, like, who are you? What, how do you identify? Who? I think it's unrealistic, but I do think that it's at least something that you should be honest with the other person at the beginning, 
because I think the unfairness of it is when you when you think you feel that way and you marry and then down the road you reassess and you think something differently and that person hasn't evolved in that place. But that could it's, happen too. Right. That, like down the road you right. didn't think that in the beginning right. and like you just have to kind of like right. go for it. Taking the leap. That's true. We grow up with the idea that love exists in an, in a like a scarcity economy, economy or something like that, whatever it is. Meaning it's a it's a limited resource. Like love is a cup of sugar. Therefore, if I give some to you, I have less to give to somebody else. But that framework is the it, we only apply that framework to romantic and intimate relationships. We don't apply that to friends. We don't apply that to family. Like if people have big families, just because they love their older brother doesn't mean they have any less love or different love for their younger sibling or just because they spend a bunch of time with their older sibling doesn't mean they don't need to spend time with their mom or vice versa, right? Like different types of love. And I think the idea around non-monogamy or like trying to, whether it's non-monogamy or monogamy, just understanding in a different framework, like understanding love, not as a scarce resource, scarce resource, but as something that breeds more of itself, like it, it not being a limited thing, but rather something that can grow and be dynamic. And, um, Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Sex Ed with DB. If you want to engage with more of our sex ed content, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check us out on our website, sexedwithdb.tumblr.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com for questions, comments, and suggestions for our episodes to come. What do you think about the intersection of polyamory and marriage? Email your thoughts to us and we can shout them out in season two. Our creator, host, and producer is Danielle Bezalow, a.k.a. DB. Our content writers and editors are Danielle Bezalow, Aaron Steinfeld, and Rachel Upton. Our graphic illustrator is Jessica Lynn. Our social media and marketing lead is Kat Lestufka. Our sound editor for this episode is Lauren Schechter. The title of our intro music is So Low by Art of Escapism. And our outro music is by my stepdad, Bill Gant. Thank you to our featured voices and our listeners. Tune in next time.